I'm always glad when they ask me to stand because, first of all, it tells me where it is I'm supposed to be looking when I talk. But <laughs> when I see that many stand, I say, I've got some work to do this evening. About 23. Uh, that's a good number. You're not the biggest I've had so far, but it's heartwarming to, uh, to see so many of you, the young people who are here, and especially as we continue in this Easter season. And now that means that, that we're not only at Mass, especially listening to the readings about Christ and resurrected, but we're already beginning to look to exactly what you are going to share in this evening, which is Pentecost, which is to come. When Christ gave that spirit to his followers, and that gets us to maybe the first task that I have to ask you to, to take on this evening, you who the young people that are going to be confirmed. And that task is to see just how real this is, to see it with the eyes of faith. Because it's, it's all too possible and all too common for us to take it for granted, to see this with the earthly eyes, to see it as simply a gathering, a reenactment, something akin to what you all are going to see in your classes in really just a few weeks now, almost at the first of May, those, those awards assemblies, where at the end of the year, everybody gets together in the hall and they call up the smart guys and they get their certificates and they call up the athletes and they get their trophies and they go back to their place and everybody applauds. And that's a great thing, but it is very earthly. What's going to happen here is something that is very real. The gift of the Holy Spirit. You may not be able to see it with earthly eyes, you may not be able to feel it with your earthly bodies. But does that surprise us when we are talking about a life and a world that awaits us, that is beyond us right now? We've all been through that before, we just don't remember. Each one of us has spent nine months in our mother's womb. And you know, especially towards the end there, we're feeling pretty warm and comfortable and this is kind of nice and no idea, maybe a faint hint of the mother's voice, giving you a hint that there's something, but this world is all that you're encapsulated in. How could there be anything more? And the very fact that we're here is that indication of what we could not know, but what we were made for, but what was waiting for us, and all of the beauty, if you had stayed in there, you'd have never met your mother and your father, you'd have never met your best friend, you'd have never scored that winning basket, you'd never have had that great test score wouldn't have known Jesus Christ and your faith. So why does it surprise us that we could go through that again? We are waiting, really and truly, for something else that in the same way we cannot see, we're told about it. We have certain indications, but by and large, God has said, trust me on this one. But the reality is still this. Just as you were made to come out of your mother's womb and be where you are today, every one of us is made to finish this life and then God made us to be with him, but he's not going to force it. He is not going to impose it on us. It is to each one of us to choose. But Christ has been looking at each one of you for all eternity because he's outside of time. Time's our limitation, not his. And so he's able to know you before the world even began. Not only to know you, know your birth date, know your, I don't know, social security number, what color your hair, he knows your heart. And that means that he knows the good and the bad, the happy and the sad. He knows the things that you do well and you're confident in, and he knows the things that you failed at. And he knows, too, the things that you have trouble with. Maybe it's problems at school. 
Maybe it's problems with your friends. Maybe it's a problem at home and even with your parents. And it weighs you down. And all of that Christ knows and he says, I know the struggle that you guys have to go through. And it's harder now because we're getting increasingly in an age that's pushing God aside. And you have to stand up almost alone sometimes to do the right thing to follow Christ. Jesus knows the pressure. He knows the peer pressure. And he's saying today, I am going to place within you the help that you will need to be ready. And be ready we must. Each one of us is going to stand before God at the end of life and give an accounting to him of the question, did you love me? Did you live like you wanted to be with me and with my father in my father's house? And we're going to have to answer the question. And he wants us to be ready. I like to read the Chronicles of Narnia. I hope you've read them. Please don't sell it for the movies. They're kind of like a knockoff version. Read the books. And especially the last one is the final battle. And that's the one where the end of all things is the story of Christ, you know, told from young people's point of view. <clears throat> And he talks about the author, C.S. Lewis, what he envisions as the last judgment. And he describes it this way. Two seconds, each one of us, face to face with Christ. Christ looking into my eyes, my eyes looking into Christ's eyes. And that's where he asks the question, but C.S. Lewis says, nothing is said. Because he knows, and I know. The moment will be real. And each one of us will stand waiting for that moment. Christ is giving you this evening the gift of his own spirit to help you to be ready for that moment, to be strengthened, to carry out through life, to be faithful in thick or thin, good times or bad, health or illness, that final <coughs> moment that we will all have to pass through the gift of the Holy Spirit. So I have to ask you to do something here this evening. And that is simply this. Believe that it's true. Believe that there is a God, that He loves me, that in spite of all the things I hear, He is a loving God who has made that other world for me. If I will make the choices now to love Him, and to live with others in a way that loves Christ and does what it is that he's told us to do. That act of faith when you come up. And I know sometimes you say, well, I don't understand everything. How can I believe? Well, I don't understand it either. But you and I do that all the time. I'm going to go home tonight. And it'll be dark by the time I get home. And I go to my room, and the first thing I do is, like everyone else, I flip the switch. Because I believe the lights are going to go on when I do that. Now, if you ask me to explain it all, I could probably start explaining some. Well, I've seen those things in the cornfields, and I've seen the, the wires. No, no, really explain it. I can't. But I don't worry about it. I simply believe those lights are going on. Why would we put God to a higher test than we put the light switch? You can come up and believe and open your mind and your heart and God will fill the rest of it. And guys, for some reason for us, it is just a little bit harder. We have to work at believing just a little bit harder. But it's worth it because it makes us a real guy and it'll make us a real man. But if you've received that gift of the Holy Spirit and had that act of faith, it's not just a half an hour, an hour here. You've got to keep going then. That's what that act of faith will mean. So what will that mean for you? It's going to mean you have to have a prayer life. You know what I mean. Not just prayers before meals, great as they are. 
it's going to mean you have got to be talking to Jesus in your mind and in your heart, you know, in that silent conversation you have with him during the day, walking the halls of school, at home, maybe raking the yard, maybe a couple of minutes alone in your room, talking to him about the day, how things have gone, telling him you want to be with him. When was the last time you prayed for your parents? When was the last time you prayed about your problems? Talking to Jesus about that. Take the Bible off that shelf. Don't read it like a novel from page 1 to 999. Read those snippets of the Gospels so you get to know Jesus. Read those letters of St. Paul and see the things that come out and remind you of what we do to be good, to be holy. Get those rosaries out of the drawer. And talk to your mother because she's going to be there in that mansion as well. Mary. And if you have that prayer life, it has got to bring you here. You have got to come to Mass each and every Sunday. And I know when I say that, there's a little shifting around because people say, well, I'm not coming every Sunday now. Well, okay, it starts now. Because I believe, I'm a follower of Christ. I bear the Holy Spirit. And parents and godparents and relatives, you have got to come too. Because we are going to have our two seconds before Christ, and we have to be ready. And they are young people. They have a right to a good example. They have a right to be praying with their family and with their parents at Mass. It's going to mean continuing to come to confession, because we do fail. But Christ, if we turn to confession, has promised to forget our sins for all eternity if we come. It's going to mean we have to live the right life. That'll mean we've got to live chastity and purity because that's of Christ. And the discipline and the prayer that will come for that will make you better and in a few years most of you will look to the vocation that you're being called to the family. You will be better disciplined, better ready to make the sacrifice a lifetime, faithful to another person. Hopefully, who's lived chastity in order to be faithful to you. It's going to mean avoiding alcohol and drugs and cutting and bad friends and bad family, bad language. Because those things harden our hearts against the Holy Spirit, against Christ. It's going to mean witnessing. Witnessing to our faith. We've got to stand up and talk about it. They're trying to intimidate us into not talking about our faith, about what's right and wrong. It means we're going to have to witness to the church itself, the freedom of the church, the freedom of religion. It means we're going to have to witness to what is so strong among our young people. The right to life. That those waiting to come out of their mother's womb have a right to be born because they are made by God and loved by God as you are. It's going to mean standing up for something that's getting harder and harder in our day. For God's plan for us for family based in marriage. We love all of our brothers and sisters, each and every one. But we love them in the context of God's plan, a man and a woman committed to each other for a lifetime and open to you, to young people, to the beauty of the gift of new life that you are. It's going to be being witnesses to the rights of the poor and the immigrant. And those who are the kinds of people like every one of us has always had in class, those kids who are kind of laughed at by everyone, kind of shunned. If we pick up sides, they're the last ones to get picked because somebody has to get stuck with them. And you could bring them the love of Christ. This is what the Holy Spirit will do for you. Getting you ready for that moment, that two seconds, that leads to all eternity at what you were meant to be. This is not just for 
as I like to say to old guys like me, it's for you. It's an agenda for young people. And we have saints who have done this time after time in the church. Who took your saints for confirmation? Did anybody take Maria Goretti? There's one, two. Sometimes, you know, I have to look a little hard because the hands don't go any higher up than this. <laughs> Did anybody take St. Therese of Mizzou? There's one, okay. Two for two. I could be playing for the Cubs today. <laughs> Did anybody take my favorite saint, Joan of Arc? There, right in the front. Three for three. Let me try one more. I don't often get this, but sometimes. Anybody take a Mexican saint canonized about seven, eight months ago? Jose Sanchez de Rio, Jose Cito. He, you would have seen it if you saw the movie, The, um, the Greater Glory. Three out of four, not bad. <laughs> there could be others. There could be Bernadette. There could be even a reflection on Pope St. John Paul and his youth, which was such a building block for his faith. But they were young saints who made that act of faith. You know the story of Maria Goretti. She was 12. She lived in a poor family in southern Italy. Her father's a field worker. She's got four younger siblings. Barely makes enough to, to put food on the table, and dad dies. Mom has to go and take his place in the field so they got something to eat. And Maria's left at home to take care of the house and take care of the siblings. And because they have no money, they share a house with a nasty man and his nasty son. Ladies, you can imagine, a 12-year-old girl under the same roof with an 18-year-old boy is not a good idea. And he begins to take a bad liking to her. And he asks her to give away her purity, and she will not. And so finally one day when there's nobody around, he insists, and she says, no, this is not right, this is sinful, and you would go to hell for this. When she won't give in, 13 times he stabs her. They find her, they take her to whatever they've got for a hospital, it isn't much. She's clearly not going to make it. She lingers, but during the day that she, before she died, she says, I forgive him. And I want him to be with me in heaven. Years later, Alejandro, who did it, said that he had had a vision of Maria prison and changed his heart, and he ends up in St. Peter's Square at that big mass when she's recognized as a saint. Then there's Jose Sanchez de Rio, 1925, Mexico. You know, we study the church, it happens time and time again as it's happening now. We talk about good as the church. We talk about justice. We talk about sin and evil and right and wrong, and we often get in the way of government. Well, it happened in 1925. And the government in Mexico tried to oppress the church because it was getting in the way. And the people rose up and said, we are free to follow our faith. And so there was the Cristero Revolution in 1925. And Jose's two older brothers go out fighting for the church, for the freedom of the church. Jose's 13. He said, oh, he says, Mom, I can't stay here. My brothers are out fighting. It's not right that I stay here. No, please stay with me. You're only 13. Mom, I can't. It's not right. I've got to go with my brothers. Off he goes. Because he's 13, they don't put him in combat. But he does the things in camp that you can do. He runs the messages back and forth. He's holding the horses, all that kind of stuff. And then one day there's a confused, quick, unplanned retreat, and he's left behind. And he's captured. And the soldiers with the guns say, oh, this is going to be easy. 13-year-old boy. Gentlemen, think about it. They tell him, Jose, here's your choice. Either you renounce right now Jesus Christ in your Catholic faith right here in front of us, or we're going to kill you. What would your answer be? 